Thanks for checking out the Chrissy Mayer podcast. We are on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Be sure to subscribe on my YouTube channel and click the notification icon. And if you're on iTunes, please go subscribe and leave a sexy or creepy review on there. I will be reading the best or worst reviews every week, so long as they are five stars. Uh, I'm so excited to have this guy on the podcast today. Um, he's got a lot of uh, da exciting dates coming up, September 11th, 12th, 13th at the Hartford Funny Bone in Manchester, Connecticut. Also, you can see him October 2nd and 3rd at Wise Guys Comedy Cafe in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, you can please check out Billboard Presents Paul Verzi, I'll Say This on Comedy Central and the Verzi Effect podcast. Mr. Paul Verzi, how are you, buddy? How are you? Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Yeah, good to have you. Um, I think I, I, I always hate bungling an intro. You're supposed to say the name as the very last thing. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's tricky. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all, we do so many of these with so many people, I'm sure that it's just like, yeah, no worries. Yeah, I know. It's like, the, it's crazy. I never thought I would do so many Zoom podcasts uh, in all my life, but yeah, this is <laughs> the times <laughs> now. Is, exactly. So Paul, um, tell me about what it's like, uh, what, it's, what the past few months have been like for you. I know that, correct me if I'm wrong, like just about everybody in your family has had COVID at some point. <laughs> yeah. Well, my, yeah, my wife and both of my children, we, I, so I started to have it. I think I had it first. I had it in, um, late late march like march 20 something 21st 22nd i had it and uh i lost my smell and taste um then five days later my wife lost her smell and taste and um and then you know my kids were okay but like my son was a little sluggish one day my daughter not so many symptoms really um me i had like a sample platter of symptoms it was like i kind of it wasn't like brutal but it was there and i knew that something was wrong and i i just the coughing at night and the, the feeling that my body had, like something was not right. Um, but the doctor said, don't get tested because no smell and taste. It's, you definitely have it. Don't mm -hmm. go out there. Other people are online. You're going to be on a long line. You have it. And then we all tested a couple of months later for antibodies and they all came back that we had them. So, wow. so yeah, so that was the thing that was scary about it was right when it was coming out with no information, I got it. So like, I would go to bed and be like, am I gonna wake up and need a fucking ventilator tonight? Am I gonna, are there enough hospital beds if I do have to have an ambulance come and take me out of here? So I was in a guest room in my own house, isolated from my family, and um, I'm just watching the news and it was all horrible. So, um, so it's like good and bad. It was like a double-edged sword. I was glad I had it early and then it went away. So by April, I was done with it but having it early made me not know what to expect, so. Yeah, had this felt like anything you had had before, symptom-wise? That's actually, that's actually a really great question, and, and I think, I wanna say the answer is, is, is no, because like you would feel like you'd be in bed, like the first two nights when I really didn't know I had it. I felt the chills and fluish, like I had the flu, and chills and for sure had a fever just the way I yeah. felt I mean my whole life I know what a fever feels like but then you would take your temperature and you didn't have a fever which was really weird so like and then just the cough was off and my body was off so I would say it was definitely a different type of it was it was similar in ways but my body felt different for sure yeah and it's interesting because I spoke with Jeffrey Gurian, who, um, you know, is a, a mainstay on the on the on the sort of stand up circuit he performs, but he also writes a lot about the, the New York City stand up scene. He had coronavirus or COVID um, also really early on. And he, uh, you know, agrees that it was very scary during that beginning time with little to no information. He was kind of self medicating from home. Uh, yeah, also very scared to go to the hospital. He was on like his own Z packs that he had hoarded for like a good two weeks before he realized like, Oh shit, I need to get to a hospital. And he did, he actually did get on a ventilator and he's, uh, he actually was able to get off of it, which I've heard is not often the case because the ventilator is sort of like 
train your lungs to be um, like more dependent on that help. And then they're less able to kind of like breathe on their own afterwards. But yeah, what happens, I think, is your brain basically tells your body like you're basically telling your brain, oh, I don't need I don't need myself right now. And, and they were saying that like 50% of people that went on the ventilator, if they, they just, you know, it was like a 50-50 shot to come out of it, which is incredibly scary. Um, and the worst thing is like not being, that was the other thing. Like I have two little ones and to think that there's a chance, like luckily like by the time I got to day eight or nine, I was like, I'm good. But to think that there's a chance, the scary thing was people are dying without anybody even being able to be there. Uh. Mm -hmm. So it's like the whole thing was just, you know, was a nightmare. And, and uh, yeah, you know, and then I went out to Arizona to perform um, when I was better. Because when I had the antibodies, I told my agent and manager, I go, I'm ready to go if things are safe. So they called up hospitals in Arizona. They, and, and, and then I went out there and people were like, it's bad out here. I did the shows, left and realized that Arizona became the epicenter. So, but I will tell you this, Chris. Like it wasn't this, me. <laughs> this is, yeah, right. But this is true. They didn't care out there, man. When I was out there, they were looking at me with a mask, like, you know, like, the fuck is this guy doing? You know, like, what, what yeah. is, and, and I'm just going, like, the, the problem I think with this is. This was what, April, May? No, so I went out to Arizona in June. Okay, okay. But it was, like, right when their numbers started to, to, to move up. And before I got on the plane, I was like, should I be going? You know, I don't want to. And so my manager called up the club that my agency called up hospitals and like, they really wanted to get information because I'm like, if I'm going to be in a room, even 50% capacity or whatever the rules are, I just want to make sure people are kind of safe. And, um, they called up and they told me that all precautions, I will say that it was, I mean, uh, the, the one hospital was like starting to get some people. The other hospital wasn't. So it's not like I went there when people were flooding the hospitals there, but the numbers and cases were going up. Um, my hotel was completely clean. I stayed in my hotel a lot. The green room, I was kind of isolated. So in that sense, there were three microphones, one for the host, one for the feature, one for myself. So it was good that way. But now looking back, I'm just like, the, the problem with this is, and I really believe this, I am not one of these you know, oh, well, the, the left says wear a mask and the right says don't. I'm like, I'm like, I don't make shit like this political. You know, I, I said before on another podcast, like my father is the most conservative fucking guy anybody's ever met, ever. I don't care. I mean, whoever you think is conservative times that by 10, that's my father. And my father's like, I'm wearing a fucking mask because I don't want to die. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. It's conservative. Just, mm -hmm. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't politicize it. And I think that that's the, that was, that's the problem now because, like, the reason why we're not going back to stand-up and doing what we love and making money the normal way that we should be making it, I think, is because we're so divided that mm. people will, like, defiantly not wear it, which huh. is crazy to me. And it's, especially from your, from your point of view, it's like you had it, your whole family had it, you yes. know, you, you know, like, uh, I mean, my mom died two years ago, but it's like, many of us have like, you know, parents that are like kind of in that it's, it's, it's easy to be scared when you have parents who are older and have pre existing conditions. And, yeah. you know, if it's like, yeah, that's a whole other podcast is like how effective all these, all this stuff really is. But if it makes you feel better to wear it, yeah, wear it, you know? Um, yeah. 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 And I think you hit it right on the head with like, you know, my mom had cancer and the Dana Farber Institute saved her life with a, a trial drug years ago. And they called her during this and they said, like, look, you're really susceptible to, to this and, and some, it could be bad for you. And there's a lot of my moms walking around right now. So like mm -hmm. and it's weird because it's funny because people like uh, people don't know what to think about when I say things because they're like, wait, I don't understand what he is like because I can't stand hmm. what the far left is, the radical far left is doing and, and with, with, with just like all of the, like the cancel culture and all that. And, and, yeah. and I, I understand that. But at the same time, I'm like, why not just wear a mask? And then people are like, well, wait a minute, what side are you on? And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm not making this political. I just want things to get better. And if putting a mask over my face when I go out to the store is going to do that, then I'll do that if, if it's going to make things speed up so we can get back to normal. That's just, that's how I look at it. I never make things like that political. 
Yeah, I totally understand. And that's like a fair point. And you lived it and you care about the people around you. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't, I think a lot of people like to put somebody in a, in a group. The mask issue is something that has been so divisive. I think the people that are strongly against wearing it go like, you know, it's there. I think maybe they're looking at the bigger picture. Like why has everything been show, so shut down for a virus that's only, that is like 99% survivable. Right. And maybe it's, you know, it's easier to, to feel that way when nobody in your life has been affected by it. And a lot of these people are upset that their businesses have gone under during this time. And um, you know, at first we were hearing that the masks really aren't all that effective and now they're back to being effective again. And people are frustrated with the, you know, the confusion yeah. of information and all that. Uh, but it's been interesting to see how, how this has translated to comedy because I feel like there's always been kind of a, a comedy. Well, I feel like now the, the, the comedy civil war that I feel like might've been bubbling uh, under the surface for a couple of years, I feel like now has really come to the forefront. And I noticed this a lot um, with the with the black square for Black Lives Matter. It was, there was, I felt there was so much pressure to be like, well, no, no matter how everybody, how anybody feels about anything, if you don't put a black square on your, on your Instagram, it means that you don't support, uh, you know, black lives or something. And, and I, there was something yeah. kind of icky about like this hive mob mentality um, that I feel like was just sort of one aspect of, I, I feel like in comedy now there's kind of like the, the woke comics versus not even like that I would call them the not woke comics, but the comics who seem to be working full time and put comedy and what's funny above kind of all else. And is that something you have noticed? You know, you've been doing comedy for, you know, a lot of years right now. You've been on the road a lot. Um, what have been your observations as far as this, like, yeah. comedy divide? I, I think that, um, I think that you just hit it on the head. I agree with you a thousand percent. I think that, you know, I'm the type of person that, like, it's, like, again, like, I, I think... I can't stand the far left and the far right. I can't stand either when it, when it becomes that. But now when comedians fall into that and that comes into our world and I'm going like, we're, we do jokes. We do jokes. So, you know, when that whole blackout screen thing happened, like I was out playing golf with my stepfather and I was doing things with my kids. So it's like, I'm not even, I'm looking at like people's pages going like, is this broken? Are they, is everybody, <laughs> is, 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 you know, is Instagram down? And then later that day, I found out what's going on. Because like I said, I woke up early in the morning, I'm playing golf, I'm doing things. And then I got to be honest, I, I took exception. I did not like when some comedians, you know, were saying things like, oh, we're watching you or, or all you, yeah. you know, all you, it's like all you comedians out there who aren't saying your your non your non posts are are speaking volumes and I'm going first of all I got fucking kids I'm taking care of up here mm -hmm. and I'm 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 trying to get through this my whole family had this thing we're 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 doing stuff in the house we're we're being together I'm sorry if your fucking activism it is not contagious onto me it's like I raise my kids to treat them people with respect everybody of all colors but I do it my way. Okay, and just because you want to march through a park with a fucking sign and scream things and do that, that doesn't mean that I'm teaching my kids not the right thing. So I didn't like how people were trying to almost tell me, like bullying me. Yes. And, and yeah. bullying other comedians who were just like, you know, what about like the comedians? Like, of course, I think that, that a black life matters. Who the yeah. fuck doesn't? You know, you got to be a lunatic to not. But when people are like bullying you to like get down here in these streets with us. And I'm like, well, first of all, it's not safe for me to drive there right now because I see what they're doing to cars. <laughs> yeah. You know? People are getting I'm attacked. There's, there were more people attacked during the, the riots and the protests than there were black people who were shot by white cops that, that started the move, the whole movement there, you know, I, 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 like I, I understand if somebody wants to peacefully protest something they're upset about. No, you know, that's the, your right to do. 
If you see something that, you know, we all saw what happened to George Floyd and it was one of the most horrific things you could see for that. It was brutal to yeah. watch. Yeah. And I understand that people want to, and if you want to say things and if you want to talk to government officials and if you want to peacefully protest, but like uh, people were almost acting as if online, what I felt was like, if I don't drive my car down there <laughs> yeah. and, and get, and, and it's like, and, and I'm, like I said, I'm playing golf with family that I never really get to do that with, or like being with my kids that I, you know, you see me in the city. I drive there a lot during stand up. Um, that's what I did forever. That's what I do. That's my life. I go on the road. So to be able to kind of take a beat and redo things online, work on my online presence, get my special out there, build a studio in my house, which I did to do that stuff. So I just don't like when people tell me what I should be doing socially. You know, it's like, I think me and my wife have done an amazing job with our kids and we never would judge anybody for anything, but I don't like being bullied or told what to do. And also being told that I'm not a good person if I'm not doing what you do. That's the same thing to me as if, you know, cause the, you know, you're putting religion onto somebody, oh, you know, it's yeah. like, don't, it's like, I have my beliefs, but don't tell me that I need to be in church all the time. And if I'm not, I'm going to go to hell. Right. Yeah. But I could still have my beliefs, so I, I, that's, that's how I feel. And, you know, and, and listen, I have a ton of black friends. And of course, I understand Black Lives Matter. I understand that, you know, all of these people that are hurting during this time, but I don't like being told what I need to be doing socially. Yeah, I, I thought it was particularly icky that, that, you know, we as comedians or anybody who's in the entertainment or creative field needed to not, that was the idea that it was the blackout day, right? You needed to not post anything except for this black square, which I think is like really kind of ridiculous to impose that on people, especially at a time where a lot of our sources of income have been cut down. You know, a lot of us have been taking this time to start podcasts or work on other streams of income and kind of build ourselves up because we're all entrepreneurs here. Like we all have to keep our, our businesses going and our, and our income flowing. And so to say that if, you know, that you need to be totally blacked out and silent for a whole day or else you're a shitty person, that that's a horrible imposition to put on especially somebody who is you know looking like our part of our whole you know comedy business there's such a large internet component and a large social media component you know it's like let's say your album came out that day or a special and you have to plug it oh now but now you can't plug it because you're you're a bad person if you don't do the black square and uh follow the mob um so it's been it's been yeah. sad to see it, it's it, it, yeah, it really bothers me because it's like, it's just, I've noticed it's such a, there's such a divide between and, and a different kind of behavior from the people that are like really working comics and the ones that are like, have some sort of other income or maybe their parents support them or it's easy for them to be like, fuck it, I'll just, you know, protest every day because I don't have anywhere to be. And it's like, yeah, a lot of us have kids to take care of, you know, old parents to take care of, you know. Yeah. To jobs to sort of maintain um and what i've really liked and noticed is that the stand comedy club in new york city is one of the few places i've seen that really supports comics uh i feel like they kind of always yeah. have um anytime there's like a comedy controversy or like some kind of comedian is under fire or someone's trying to cancel them i find that the stand is always on the side of the comics and they support free speech and they're, they're, you know, pro funny over like pro like wokeness or whatever. Um, and I noticed like, yeah, like you, I think you seem to have a, a good relationship to the club and the owners. Um, and have you, have you known them to kind of always be that way or when did you get more involved with the stand? Yeah. So I got involved with the stand actually before the first one opened up. Um, I, you know, I was represented by, um, you know, Chris Italia and uh, the late David Kimowitz, um, rest his soul. But I, I was I was repped by them and they were building the club and they were always comedy first. Always, always, always the comic and always the comic can say what the comic wants to say. Um, they're they're against all oh, well, of there's rules because there's no rules. You know, it's like George Carlin said that, too. There's no there's no fucking rules. Like, I'm going to get on stage and I'm going to say a joke. And if it's insensitive and it falls flat, then that's kind of on me with the joke. But it's still an attempt of humor and to be funny. So the stand always understood that. 
And, um, you know, David and Chris always kind of let you do that. And, and, and the Booker Patrick, they wanted that, as a matter of fact. They encouraged it. They encouraged that more than just the low-hanging fruit and the easy stuff and the stuff that, every, you know, oh, yeah, that's fun. They would want you to, like, push buttons and make it funny because they knew that that was making you a better comedian. So, you know, I agree. Um, it's nice to have that as, a, as your haven, as your home. It's nice to know that, like, where you go to work, the people behind you think like you and, 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 and have your back as an artist, which I love, you know, as opposed to, you know, owners and bookers watching out for you and making sure you're not saying something. And if you do, you know, then they have to have a talk. Like, I'm done with that shit, man. Like, oh, don't say that. I was recently at a place where, uh, well, not too recently, but I was at a place where it was like, you know, hey, they don't like when you do this. They don't like when you do that. And it's like, you know what? It's like, then, then that's not, then they don't really love the art. What were the you things know? that they didn't like? They just didn't want, like, it was just rules about, like, you know, when place like, don't make fun of the area. Don't make fun of, like, don't, don't, you know, if, if, if somebody goes at you, you can't, you know, you can't. I mean, I've heard of things where, like, people would heckle, and when the comic would say something brutal or, you know, call a woman a word that, that that's really not appropriate, like, you know, oh, you know, you need to go apologize. They're a patron here. And it's like, no, uh. it's like, no. It's like, no, it's like, this is what I'm doing. And in the moment, that was appropriate, whether too far or not. You know, you could say to me afterwards, wow, you went really hard. Okay, fine. That I can deal with. But to sit down and go, you need to apologize to them. Like, I can't, or you're not going to work here anymore. No. And the stand is opposite of that. That would be like an athlete having to apologize for like missing a pass or missing a catch or something. It's like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, this is part of the deal. Like, why is that not like, you know, yeah. you don't, we don't see like artists uh, like get a painter be like, Oh, I have to apologize for this painting. I painted it, you know, in the heat yeah. of the moment, you know, um, that's what I don't yeah. understand. <laughs> like, it's like, this is, this is stand up comedy. Like, it, you shouldn't be defined by any one set, just like you shouldn't be canceled for something you did years ago or an impression that you did years ago, even, or a current impression. Um, people should understand when they walk into a comedy club, like this is not, it's not like, a, you know, everything is safe and everyone's, you know, we're not here to like take care of everybody's feelings like we're here to make you laugh and and however way the comic can get there it's a thing it's like yeah. well like the market's gonna decide if you're too offensive if you if you like call everybody a right. cunt if you then guess what you're eventually gonna get less and less booked and it's up to you to kind of like adjust your set but if it's that's a great that's actually one of the best ways that it's put it's like let the market decide like that's a that's a really way, good way to look at it it's like it's funny because, um, and I don't want to say this to pat myself on the back, so I hate to use an example about Go something ahead. that I did. Go ahead, pat yourself but, on the back. <laughs> but, 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 you know, my special, my special right now, and especially during pandemic, has like over 8 million views of clips. Like, Whoa. so my online, my online clips of I'll Say This, whether it's the lightsaber joke, the Trump joke, the, the insults joke, the, the, the driving with my family joke, all of those clips have over 8 million views, right? Wow. All of those, all of those people, and, and, and I'll be the first to admit this, Comedy Central, I got that in a package deal with a contract that All Things Comedy did. So All Things Comedy packaged a deal with, oh, we're going to do three specials for you. We're going to do a TV show with you. Here's the people we want. It was myself. It was Jessica Kearson. It was Ian, Ian Edwards. And we were the three that were going to be all things comedy specials that were on Comedy Central. And Comedy Central probably wouldn't take in a comedian like me had I not been packaged in that deal. But then, but then, yeah, but then when the numbers came out and people saw it, it was like the market spoke. And it was like, oh, okay. Oh, that's why all things comedy did it, because the market spoke. So if something comes out offensive to somebody, and they're like, well, we don't like that, but five to six or seven million people do, like, and, and the opposite. When people don't, and, 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 and a shitty special comes out, and shitty jokes come out, then all of a sudden you're gonna see that. You're gonna see, oh, 
you know what? This isn't about any political views. This isn't about, this is just bad comedy, right? And, and the market's going to let the person know. And to your point, if somebody does keep calling somebody cunt, if somebody does keep just doing things for whatever, eventually when they see the lack of bookings and they see that people are kind of turning their back on them, they're going to go, oh, well, maybe I need to adjust. And like you said, and I think it was beautifully put what you said, they'll figure it out because part of this business is also being smart at business Mm -hmm. and not just what you do on stage, you know? Uh, I, I learned that from working with great people and, but I was always that way as well. And then seeing how it is, is like, oh yes, there, there's a lot more to this game than just what we do with the art and on stage that I, that is a hundred percent true. Yeah. And if you're smart, you're constantly making adjustments, you know, you're constantly, you, if you're a smart comic or any kind of entrepreneur, but especially a comic, you should be looking into your demographics. Like who are my fans? How do I get more of them? Um, you know, watching your, your social media followings and things like that. And, and, you know, people can say, oh, like, well, it's wrong to have YouTube stars in comedy clubs. It should just be real comedians. I think comedians have a lot to learn from YouTube stars and YouTube stars that want to get into comedy have even more to learn from stand-up comics. Because at the end of the day, like, the, the club needs to fill their venue. And um, if they, ha- you know, yes, the, the comedy business is, is it, you know, evolving and changing a little bit. And sure. If, uh, like, I'm not, I'm not gonna, what's his name. I mean, I don't want to use the example of like Jeremy Piven, but like Logan Paul or whatever, either, I guess they're all kind of similar ish in that way where it's like a celebrity booking. Um, you know, they should be able to do what they want to do if that fills the room and keeps the place in business. And like, let's say with Jeremy Piven, right? Let's say he starts stand up, but he just like sucks and blows and people walk out. Like he will eventually, you know, he might've had that initial advantage at the top, the ability to fill a room because he has so many fans from Entourage. But if he doesn't do the work and, and become a good comic, he's going to fall. Um, and I feel like comics have a lot to learn from YouTube stars about promoting themselves and posting and, um, being on as many platforms as they can. Especially now. Yeah. 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 So uh, that's really interesting. So you feel like Comedy Central wouldn't have booked you just based on yourself alone. And I, I think it's, I I don't know who's in charge over Comedy Central. I don't know if they have, you know, I think. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I I think that the demographic of what Comedy Central is doing and and what they were what they're building at the time that my special was coming out, you know, might not be me. You know, I'm a I'm a guy's guy. You know, I'm a I'm a guy that like I like to you know I'm a family guy. I'm a guy's guy. Like I'll smoke a cigar. I'll I'll have a couple of drinks. I I like sports. And I'm not saying that they didn't have people like that, but. It just seemed, especially even when I watched the content that they were doing, and I knew that they thought that I was funny and liked me, but I just didn't know if they thought it was a fit. But then in this package deal, I think that they were like, oh, we're going to get a bunch of specials. And like they were, you know, All Things Comedy was adamant about me because, you know, I did my album with them and the album was number one and they they saw me growing. Yeah, they saw me growing and Al Madrigal and Bill Burr saw me performing a lot. And they were like, and then my initial deal fell through with Comedy Dynamics. I was never doing a special with Al and Bill and all things comedy. I was doing it with Pete Davidson. Well, Pete was part of the first one, but I was doing it with Pete Davidson and and Comedy Dynamics. And that fell apart. I realized that I was getting ripped off, to be completely honest. And, you know, I know people, you know, but yeah, I I just knew things weren't being right, done right by me. And I walked from it. And then all things comedy go, well, this is good timing because we want to get in the stand up business of, I mean, of specials, I should say. They want to get in the special business. And, um, and they were like, you know, and they worked a, a content deal with, with, with Comedy Central. So, um, no, I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm guessing. And by the, way, by the way I was feeling and what was going on, I, I don't think so. I think that it was, you know, it was just the way that it worked out. So I'm not saying it would have went somewhere else. I mean, if we didn't go there, we could have went somewhere else. I would have put it somewhere else, put it out myself, whatever. But, um, yeah, I, there, there are certain times, you know, you got to be good in this business too. Like we were talking before, you have to, 
you have to understand, and, and I think something that is happening that's amazing right now in our business, Christy, to be honest with you, is the power of the industry is, is weakened. Mm. And it's, 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 you can't deny, it, it all goes back to what you said. I mean, the whole thing of what you said before, it's the market. You, when numbers are there, you could say, oh, well, we want this person, we want that person. The bottom line is when numbers are there and money's there, you can't deny that. And if somebody goes and does that themselves, you know, look what, look what Andrew Scholes is doing. Oh look my gosh. What, what, yeah. You know, he's he's like, putting together his own little show. Like he, he has a legit yeah, set. Yeah. His stuff is so pro professionally yeah. done. He is constantly pushing yeah. the envelope, but in a way that's kind of yeah. friendly to, you know, the general population. Um, yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's smart. Yeah. It's very smart. And it's like, okay, I can get a camera crew and I could do my own thing. And you know what, when those numbers go through the roof, I don't need anybody. So mm -hmm. that, that is the beautiful thing, you know, and, and, uh, you know, hopefully that never gets taken down, but you know, um, yeah. So I, I do think like we hold a lot more power now because I know people that no network will give them a special and they can put it on YouTube and get 5 million views. And it would be more successful that way if they promote it the right way. That, that's a beautiful thing, but you do have to be smart and you do, but I will say this, there is a flip side. Okay. And I think you'll agree with this. You can't be a fucking idiot when you go on a podcast. You can't be a fucking idiot when you go somewhere and say something for shock value mm. that you don't believe in your heart. Mm. You know, you don't believe it in your heart, really. Or you just want to, you know, you want to ruffle feathers for no reason other than to try to make waves. And then somebody calls you out on your shit and you can get. Now, I'm not saying anybody should be canceled for that. But you have to be smart. You have to understand that. You have to understand what's going on, you know, and you have to understand how to talk to people. And you have to understand that, like, a lot of times people have a hard time putting themselves in other people's shoes. And it's very hard to put yourself in other someone else's shoes when you don't agree with that person. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so so like to be like, fuck that guy or fuck that woman, whoever, forget that mm -hmm. person. I can't stand them because that's bullshit. But to take yourself back and go for a second. All right. Where are they coming from? If, I think doing that is very hard to do, especially if, if somebody's irrational and unreasonable. You know, those people can't be talked to, though. I'm not talking about those people because those mm -hmm. people can't be talked to. I'm not talking about the far radical people that you just, no matter what you say, no, no, no. I'm not talking about that. Right. I'm talking about somebody that you just might have a disagreement with or really not understand. I think if you could just kind of try to find a way or at least think that way, it's like when we go on stage, okay? and we say something on stage into the microphone. And the, the late, great Patrice O'Neill, I believe it was Patrice who said, just believe what you're saying. As long mm -hmm. as you stand behind it. And when somebody comes up to you afterwards and goes, well, why did you say that? And you go, you want to know why? Because this, this, and this. That's Be able to why. back it up, yeah. And if you're not happy, fuck off, okay? If, if, if that is something that, that's how I think we need to do everything. We need to do that with pods. We need to do that yes. with, we need to do that with our stand up. Cause if you truly believe it in your heart and you truly uh, stand behind what you're saying, then you really can't lose. And if somebody's not going to like you for that, but then you get people that just want to shock value and just say shit and then they go, Oh, now you're calling me out. That's, that's bullshit too. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, yeah. I remember just with the example of like Louie, you know, when the Louis drama was happening, I think a lot of people were shitting on him just to elevate themselves without really fully knowing or with the Crystalia stuff. Crystalia, I was just going to say. Quickly Crystalia. shitting, yeah, shitting on him to elevate themselves and like, all right, without finding out all the facts, without looking into it, oh, this is a famous person. We're all attacking now. Here's my chance for everybody to see me because we're all up here shitting on this, on this same guy. And then it came out I'm that like, that he actually didn't, have sex with anybody underage he was able to prove you know he had his own receipts of of texts and whatnot um and he, he i think he ended up looking okay on that um see but. that so all, so all that stuff like as far as facts of that and what happened with that i don't know because once that happened i was just like 
you know, wow. And like all that stuff was going on. And, and that week was crazy for me. And then people are going, did you hear about Dalia? So I don't know. I know that somebody said he sent out receipts. I didn't see any of that. And I don't know any of the facts, but I do know this, what you just said before anything happened or anybody knew anything, all of these nobody comedians and all of these comedians just jumping on going like, well, the real offensive thing is his act. The real offensive thing is a special. It's like, oh, why? Because now you don't think you're going to hear from him anymore. Mm. And, and, and so now you're going to say all the things that you were thinking when, and it's like, that's the shit that, that I, you know, that I find gross. And it's like, you know, you, you notice how it's people that didn't even come close to achieving. Mm -hmm. Come close to achieving what, what Chris D'Elia achieved. You know, you could say whatever you want about somebody's act, whether you like the act or not. At the end of the day, the guy put out multiple specials, made millions of dollars, and has millions of fans. So yeah. it's like to, to jump on when you're just fucking sitting in your studio apartment, you know, fucking, you know what I mean? Like, you know, upset because you don't have spot money to pay your rent, and you're going to shit on a guy and almost be happy. You know, we... We're seeing things where people are happy for downfalls. Now, listen, Grant. Yeah. If you see yeah. a piece, of if you see a piece of shit go down, you know, if you if you see Harvey Weinstein go down, if you see Bill Cosby go yeah. down, and these, these guys were raping yeah. women. Yeah. Then you're yeah. Then you're like, all right, you know, fuck that guy. Karma's a bitch. You know, yeah. they, what goes what goes around comes around. But to just hear one story without facts of anything. And I'm not just talking about, I'm not talking about Dalia here, or I'm not talking about Louie here. I'm talking about in general, it seems like the society we're living in now, the, 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 the social, the, it's like you hear the person's name and you, you hear one thing. And, and in an allegation, mind, like, yeah. Done, done. Yeah, yeah. his own friends. Sure his own friends, like, and it's, uh, there was a fun, I don't know, maybe a, a clip or an episode of, of Tim Dillon's show where he, he was so funny about it. He was like, he's like, do I think I'm going to get more spots if he, go, if he gets taken down? Yeah. You know? And I think that's funny because that's in a lot of these, um, maybe his peers or friends go, Oh great. Now I'm going to like scoop up all of his spots. If he gets taken down and taken out, it's like, Com comedy is so cutthroat it's such a thin veil that even if you're like friends uh with somebody and there's some allegation it's like whoop it's so quick to be like fuck this guy um and what's gonna happen and what's gonna happen too what's gonna happen too is that um it's gonna continue to i think what's gonna happen this is my prediction and i could be wrong i think what's gonna happen is i think it's gonna get to the point where cancel culture it's going to make people roll their eyes after a while because it's getting so, it's almost like getting hacky now. It it's is. almost like, like it's, 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 yeah, it's like hacky now. So I think what it is, is listen, if you're a piece of shit and you broke the law and you assaulted somebody and you did something really fucked up, then yeah, you should get what's coming to you. But when somebody says something or somebody does something on stage or somebody does a character 10 years ago yeah. that, that is not socially accepted now to go back, I think it's just going to get to the point where it's just like, oh, shut up. Yeah. Just shut up, man. It's like, it's just nobody, you know, get out of the business then. Are, are, yeah. you that fucking, are you that fragile? Are you that fragile that a joke, something that was made to give happiness? How crazy? You, I'm sorry, you got me excited now. No, it's, so, yeah. I get fired up about this too. Yeah, it's like we we actually our job is to take this and to take this hmm. and to write down things that are gonna make a group of people happy or make a group of people think or put light on something that could be horrible, right? And we try to find ways to make the mind go, all right, I'm away from my problems and I'll just laugh at this. Mm -hmm. And to have these people come to have people actually go to a booker or an owner and go, I really didn't appreciate that. They need to, and all this stuff and they shouldn't work here again. And I'm going to protest it to, to think that, that, that could, that action or result can come from somebody trying to make you happy or just be is to me is a huge, huge problem. And I'm hoping for, for everybody's sake, that we don't go backwards and that becomes the norm where I do think eventually, hopefully the cancer culture will become such a hacky dumb, like for things that aren't a big deal. And you're just like, really? That guy said something in 2007 that made you kind of cringe and they shouldn't work again or put food on their table for their families. Like, are you out of your fucking mind? 
Yeah. I, that's my hope too. And like, I think the, the stand is like one of the leading examples on that, but I think other, other venues are realizing now, or they will realize like, Hey, just about any comic is quote cancelable over an old tweet, an old bit, an old impression. They were, people were coming after Jessica Kirsten uh, a week or oh. so ago. She's one of the absolute best. She is like uh, so many comics, uh, idol and mentor and like she's she's well well respected um it's i hope it is more laughed off and shrugged off because you know com professional comics like we don't get to this point because it's easy or because it's glamorous or because we know we're gonna make a ton of money it's like if, if you're a professional comic you do it because you love it and you feel pulled to do it like it's it's like yeah. you feel pulled to express yourself in this way and there's nothing better than uniting a group of a room full of strangers to laugh about the same thing all at the same time like yeah of course it's a power it makes it makes me for sure feel validated and uh helps my confidence and all that stuff but sure the bigger picture to like to make everybody forget about their problems and to laugh at me or if i'm being self-deprecating then they, you know if somebody else is in the crowd's like oh wow my dad used to beat me too cool i'm not alone and we can all like laugh about the same thing <laughs> sorry to pick the most dark example but um <laughs> oh you and, were yeah you were brutally abused yeah <laughs> let's start drinking and it's like to try to cancel comics who it's like we're doing this now because it's easy but because we we love it and it, it ultimately comes down to like a love for people and uh making observations about the world that we can all kind of enjoy together um and it's to me like cancel culture is ultimately the one of the most selfish acts because it's it's basically telling someone or a group of people that they can't enjoy what they enjoy they can't laugh at what they find funny um, which is so selfish. It's like you are making everybody else's experience about you, your preferences, your triggers, your whatever, lack of sense of humor. Um, and you're putting that onto everybody else. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, that's why I always felt as though comedy clubs should have a disclaimer. You know, I think that a comedy club should have a disclaimer right outside the showroom. I truly believe mm. it. And I also, and I also believe that they should be made with all these rules that people have. Well, how about this for a rule? There's going to be a disclaimer outside the showroom that you have to take a picture with your phone of. Okay. And, and it's <laughs> going to say, it's going to say, you are going to hear things about drugs and violence and, and sex and disease and special needs and, <laughs> and, 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 and race and everything else, everything under the sun, you're going to hear. If any of those topics will offend you, you have free to go now and get a refund. If not, take a picture of this on your phone and go in. Honestly, like if that's what it comes to, because I don't understand somebody that decides to go. Well, actually, I do understand it because what they do is they're, they're not going for the show. They're not going for the laughs. They're not going to have a good time. You want to what make they're a statement. Going to do, mm -hmm. What's that? It's like they, they're going to like, yeah, make a statement. Yeah, they're going to make a statement. They're going to get offended. They're actually going out to hope, to hope that they can go to a manager and be outraged. And it's not about the thing. And so, so for me, it's like what, Je you know, Jessica, I publicly had Jessica's back and we also spoke privately about it. And, you know, we were talking and it was just like, and, and I publicly said like, you know, and I love that she really, you know, just didn't back down and she was doing this, but it's like, when, when you, when you try to, you can hurt somebody like that. You can hurt somebody's life and you could hurt somebody's career. So think about it. It is selfish. It's like, so you're uncomfortable. You're uncomfortable with something that you didn't, that you didn't like. Okay. Well, you can go back to in living color. You could go back to SNL. You could go back to HBO shows. I'm sure. Mr. Mad show TV. Is Bob and Tom, yeah. Mad TV. You could go back to all of these shows, probably even before our time. You could probably go back to the Carol Burnett show. You could. Yeah. You could, even married with children. You could, you know, ma married with children, all these things and be like, this is an outrage. And it's like, listen, some things could be, and listen, I'm not saying that everything, I'm sure some shows have made mistakes where people are like, oh, but that's a little, you know, I mean, listen, that's just, that's just life. Yeah. But to, to end somebody, to, 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 to just throw an ax down on somebody's life and career because they did something was just, you know, um, if you watch the, 
the my closing joke of I'll say this, the special, I did a mass shooting joke, but I, I disclaimed it before. <laughs> and, and I really talked about it and, and I didn't get shit because I actually said to people like we do these jokes to put light on horrible things. Uh, I mean, that's, that, you know, for me, that's fun to take something to make people get a little bit like, where's he going to go? And then make it go, oh, well, you know, it's funny. And, and to feel scared like that. But as long as the reason why I, I started to, to, uh, to talk about it, and I apologize if I, I was long winded with this. No, answer. you're good. <laughs> um, I think that comedians just can't back down and comedians just can't apologize. Um, obviously, if they do something really fucked up, of course, but I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the thing with Jessica, the thing with certain people. Like, I'm talking about when you're not breaking the law, when you're not assaulting or hurting somebody, when you're not harassing anybody, when you're not doing something that could put people in harm. I'm talking about when you're just talking about jokes and things that you did. And I think what Kevin Hart did with the Oscars by refusing to apologize for a tweet 10 years ago. Yeah, granted, he lost the gig, but he stuck, his, he stuck to his guns. And, and the same thing with, with Jessica, uh, you know, just saying, look, man, I'm not, I'm not backing down from any of this. I know the person I am. Mm. And that, that's, what, that's what we need to do, you know, instead of then you have some people I don't want to mention names going. I made a big mistake. I'm going to grow from it. I really, I just, I need to. And it's like, what? How, what how is that? Yeah. How is that how you really feel? It just, it never comes off genuine or in that person's voice. It always yeah, seems like, it's like a template apology, yeah. you know? Yeah. Or those celebrities that were like making these black and white videos where they're like, talking about like everything going on and like you could see them reading a cue card and yeah. it was actually like bad acting it was like if you really feel that way make your own youtube clip yes you know I mean? make your make your own fucking sit home with your laptop or your phone and sit down and say what you have to say and then you put it out on your own social media don't have a company or a sponsor do it and then have people see your eyes reading something like that it's like be genuine i go i actually think that's more insulting to the group i yes. actually think that that's more insulting to any group whether it's a black lives matter issue whether it is a domestic violence issue whether it's a, 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 a even climate change whatever you want to do when you do it and you're ordered to in, in in this like dramatic video and you're reading it mm -hmm. how is that coming from the heart and making you like that to me that's like that's actually gross that's fucking gross yeah. Yeah, I like. I think the general public would, and we can tell just like how a, a live crowd at a comedy show can tell if someone's genuine and owning their stand-up set. It's like you can sniff it out, and like people watching like the black and white uh, video that was cut together. I think we'd much prefer to see something clunky, less professionally edited, just your face, like it's you know speaking from the heart, improvised, whatever. It doesn't have to be like the cleanest, most professionally produced thing. That, and people can right. tell, people are not stupid. We can tell when something's authentic and it's like, yeah, we can see the cue, the cue card eyes, you know, going back and forth. We can see, you're, yeah. prof you're professional <laughs> actors. We can see you professionally acting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, I'd rather, like I said, regardless of the, regardless of the topic, regardless of the issue, whatever the issue could be. It could be saving fucking cats, right? I don't care what the fuck it is, but I'd rather see you walking through a park doing it yourself and like meaning it yes. than, than doing some like some organized staged thing. That's, that's what I find insulting to the cause, to any cause. And like, that's just what it's becoming, man. It's just becoming this thing where it almost feels fake and, and not authentic. It almost feels like as soon as the cameras are off, they're like, all right, was that good? Did I get it? You know, and, yeah. and it's like, so, yeah, so, I mean, I just hope for everybody's sake, man, I just hope that we just get back to a place where people know a joke is a joke and everybody just treats people the way you want. I, I keep saying it and I know it sounds so corny and cliche. I've said it on a couple of podcasts and I hear myself saying it and I'm going, it's such a simple, if people just, if people minded their own fucking business <laughs> and treated people with respect and treated everybody the way that, that you wanted to be treated, I, every, everything would be good. And, and, and it just seems like that's a really difficult thing now, whether it be politics or whether all these issues and stuff or whether it's social media, but it's, it's really bad. And I, I hope it changes. It's because people feel such a surge of power. It's so addicting to be able to like cancel somebody to be able to like, 
you know, yeah. uh, ruin someone's life, change the course of their life. There were so many people who were so happy that Shane Gillis got fired from SNL, like friends of ours, people that should have been pulling for him, people that should have been, you know, you know, happy yeah. for him were like, fuck this guy. And it's like, we should really all be supporting each other because to think that there is a lack of opportunity in this world is, is really missing the mark because I just believe that, that there's, there's endless opportunity. We create our own luck. We create our own opportunities. Exactly like what you were saying before. If no big company is picking up your special, like put it on YouTube. It's going to blow up. You're going to make money from YouTube. It, so millions of people can see that just like with Norman's special was amazing. It's like, people are going to see that you're going to get opportunities a different way than maybe we were used to before. It's like, you, you, the power is kind of out of the hands. You don't have to sit around and wait for some company to pluck you up to start you. It's like you can start yourself. You can build your own following. You can create your own content and get it out to the people. Um, you know, it's funny too. It's like we, you know, I don't know how many years you've been doing stand up, um, and I've seen you. I've seen you a couple of times at at a, a couple of clubs, and I, you're hilarious. And and I remember really enjoying you, but. Um, you know, where, where I am and, and what I've seen in this business um, of being afraid of these gatekeepers and, and wanting to be out at a bar or a Christmas party with <laughs> somebody that was a fucking waitress or waiter and then they worked their way up to Booker and oh. now you're looking at them as the end all be all. And it's like, it's kind of, it's actually a sick thing where like, I remember being a younger comic in like 06, 07. And instead of just keeping my head down and like knowing, which I ultimately eventually did anyway, but I'd be like, oh, if we go here or, oh man, I heard the people, the executives at this network always like to go and drink at this bar. So maybe you'll yep. do that. And in your mind, you're going like, I'm fucking, I'm dancing around like this for somebody that was like a fucking accountant three years ago. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to let them validate the shit that I already know about how funny I am or how funny I could be or how funny my trajectory could be, you mm -hmm. know? And, and it's the craziest thing to me when I see all these people and I find out, Oh, you know what that owner of that comedy club did? Yeah. They were a, uh, they were a server and then they became a manager and then they bought the club and now they say, who gets booked in that club every weekend. And it be, could be one of the most prestigious clubs in it. And I'm going like, fuck everybody. And not in a <laughs> bad way. I'm saying, but like, mm -hmm. fuck everybody validating how I feel and what I'm doing. And, and, but it takes a certain point of confidence and knowing what you can. And I'm not saying, and, and by no means am I saying that some of those people have, don't know good comedy. Some of those people have an eye for funny. But... I'm talking about what we do to ourselves for, for yes. somebody that in, in a business that is so subjective yeah. and, um, and I've learned and it took me a long time to realize I'm going to get a special out there anyway. I'm going to, whether I have a good um, agent manager, which thank God I do, but if I, let's just say I did not, I'm still the same funny person. And I'm still, and I'm still going to go out there and do what I'm going to do. But these great people that believe in me and are on my team are helping that. And that's amazing. And those people that have been in the game of comedy, I can fuck with. But the people that literally are, you know, you find out what they did before and they just had a friend at a big company that can change your life and you're dancing around for them. It's brutal. Yeah, there is so much kind of like networking anxiety that we feel as comics, especially if you live in like a, if you're in like a New York or an LA scene, although like that, the LA scene, I feel like is really going to change, but that's like a whole other thing. Um, this sort of networking anxiety that you need to be more focused on on the hang and like the sort of who you're talking to, who you're in good with more so than just uh, like the concern like it's about the hang and and like the chatting people up more so than your your work and your content yes that's part of it of course you always need to be cool and play well with others and and not be a dick but the fact that you need to like bend over backwards uh for one particular booker because that's the only way you're gonna make it you'll you'll make yourself crazy and we've all we've all been there and thought that way 
Um, so it's good to know that there, there's not just one channel to success. You know, I think like a few years ago, I was just like obsessed with getting on Colbert or some other late night show. And, you know, you're running around, chopping up the same five minutes, putting it back together, you know, worried about every single word you say, you know, is it going to be okay? And to, to get on a show that nobody watches anymore, to, to get on a show where it's like your stand-up clip is going to be clipped out anyway. That's what people are going to watch. And you could just put that out probably by yourself. And if it's really good, it'll get the same amount of views and that you don't have to like yeah. change yourself or squeeze yourself to fit into a hole that you're not naturally going to fit into. It's like I, I, I think that you have an amazing understanding of things. I really believe that. I awesome. think that you, 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 uh, you see it very right. You see it great. And it's like, yeah, I think that like, um, we want things that we feel will validate what we're doing because we try, you know, we want to, we want to put ourselves, I mean, yeah, I've always had goals. I've always been a goal, short-term and long-term goal. And I've achieved a lot. There's a couple of things I fell short on, but I've, I've definitely started to get the things that I wanted to get in this business, but it just came from putting my head down and hard work and getting better. And I'm the type of person that like, if you want to win, somebody said, Ooh, yeah, I, I saw a tweet today that Giannis put out and it's a, of a quote. And it's like the best revenge is success. And, and it's true. It's like, you know, I'll, the best thing is that like, I believe deep down, I don't know, like I said, I just don't know if Comedy Central would have taken me alone because of the demographic and what's going on. But I love the fact that they had to see the millions of views. So it's like, mm -hmm. so it's like, I, I, you know, and, and it was good for them and good for me. And there's obviously no bad blood there, but like, right. you know what, when you just, when you just fucking crush and you're undeniable and you keep writing and you keep evolving and you keep getting better, you're basically going to just break those people into submission anyway. Yeah. You know, there are people out there. There are people out there that didn't think Dave Chappelle and Bill Burr were the guys. And now they're the guys. I'm sure that there were people that said no to to there were people that said no to, to to eddie murphy and chris rock probably not many but there were people that were like and it's like it's just what it looks it's like michael jordan got cut by his 10th grade uh, high school coach he got cut and and wow. it still bothers him to this day but he turned into <laughs> michael jordan so i think taking taking those things yeah taking those things and just making them making them you know listen i'm not saying like i used to be the younger like the younger version of me was like Fuck, I'm going to make them eat their words and, and I'm going to, you know, and it's like, no, I'm just going to kill them. Um, oh boy. Uh oh, Hey, a little bit. It's okay. You were saying that you used to be a little bit, maybe more Michael Jordan esque in your letting little things motivate you to be like, fuck that guy, you know, well, I, I, it's, it's a, it's a character. It's something that I have that I, I don't like. And it's something that my wife is like, you know, and you got to chill with And my daughter too. It's hilarious. My, my eight year old Sophia, I have an eight year old and an 11 year old. My son's not like that, but my daughter is like that. My daughter back, but that, that don't fucking do that to me, that mm -hmm. thing. And, and then you hold it. And I've learned in comedy and I've learned in show business to, that, that it's just really not personal. Mm -hmm. I've learned that. Like, it's not personal against me. It's, it's a subjective thing. Everybody needs to be on the same page with a, with a comic. And if they're not, then, then it doesn't work. So I just look at it like, I'm going to put my head down. I'm going to be successful. And all those people that, you know, then I've had people that ignored me now come up to me and be like, man, you're going to, you're going to, you're this and you're that. And I'm, I'm just going like, wow, man, I never would have thought that that would have happened. That would have been somebody that I would try to find out networking with them. And yeah. I'm like now yeah. I'm at a comedy club and they're coming to me. And it's like, so I just look at it like, just keep getting better. I'm still not good enough yet. I always have that mentality, but I don't have that. Oh, screw them. And, and I, where, why let that anger or that, that energy do that when what the energy should do is to just just blinders on and just keep going because that's ultimately being mad is not going to do anything 
No, it's very unproductive use of that energy. And like, I'm sure there was a teeny part of you that when like you did have that success on Comedy Central, you were probably like, yeah, I guess it's not so bad being a white man, you know? Like, hey, I guess I have something to say that's valuable and I guess I'm funny. And uh, and so, I'm I was just glad that they saw the numbers. I was yeah. glad that they saw the numbers and they saw like, wow, this is getting a ton of hits and a lot of people love that joke and it was on our network. That made me feel good because it was like, it, it did give some validation and it's like, yeah, like I'm bringing something to the table and I'm glad that it worked out. So, um, but we're in a very hard business. It's a very weird time for people right now. People, you know, I think people are having a really tough time money. Um, I think also something that's not talked about enough Chrissy in this. And I believe this is that this has taken such a mental uh, psychological toll on people. And I'm not just talking about people that money I'm talking about there's even people with money that this is taking a this is also like a mental mental thing here that's going on and I think people are acting out lashing out in certain ways and uh it's for really sure. really tough times you know but I, I believe that and I hope it gets better for sure it's definitely affecting people that's why it's always good to stay self-aware I'm not saying you know I think therapy is great it's not the the best thing for everybody but like yeah this is a circumstance in which nobody has experienced in our lifetimes and it's yeah it's affecting everybody differently and the disruption to the routine you know this is this is even if you haven't had a business that's gone under or if you've gotten COVID, it's just like these are very weird times and uh it's just gotta stay focused on yourself like take care of you and your family and um yeah it's just weird times what do you think there are some things that you learned from working with bill burr that you wouldn't have learned otherwise um well uh, you know, kind of touching on a little bit what was a little more personally in this business. And I remember Burr being like, dude, it's not personal, man. It's not personal. It, it's, and it's nothing personal against you. So learning that, I would say the business aspect, however, uh, Bill has said, and I know this, I'm actually good at the business too. So I think that I had that myself, but then watching him conduct his business also, and I'm talking about offstage, uh, I, it was kind of validating for what I was doing. He was like, yeah, that, that's a good move. So to see it done that way and, and just, you know, just handling yourself. Also, um, how you deal with like, like, I mean, Bill's obviously way more of a public figure than I am, but how you deal with talking to your fans and afterwards and people talking to you and approaching you. Um, I didn't get that anywhere like Bill did because, you know, Bill is like 11 years ahead of me in the comedy, but just seeing how he d does that and deals with it his way and, and just, you know, and, and obviously again, just treating people with respect. Me and Bill are actually very similar off stage. You know, it's very, we're mm -hmm. very much like uh, we kind of come from the same type of things at home and we kind of have the same issues. So, um, yeah, I think just like on the business end, I would just, he just let me know, listen, it's going to get frustrating, but it's not personal. And, and, you know, I have that fucking Mediterranean, Sicilian and Greek crazy <laughs> shit. That's just like, you know, no, no, this is personal. I got kids. And it's like, no, you know, like, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was just what it, it was just the circumstances and nobody's saying, oh, you know, in that situation, like, fuck Paul Verzi. No, they're just saying like right now, that's not, and, and I had to learn that. So that was something. And, um, you know, just, yeah, just kind of keeping like a, keeping a, a cool head, which I had, but he helped me do that in the business end of it too, as well. And he also did say there were also things where I'd be like, man, I'm not one of these comics that just wants to go and fucking have to network and go out to parties and talk to people. I'm not good at that. He, you know, he goes, well, get good at it. Uh -huh. because, because going out there and and at least talking to people and letting people know who you are doesn't mean you're going to try to get something but like being seen is so things like that you know um he wasn't saying go you know drink at the christmas party and try to get a get a gig he was just saying like don't be the guy who's like i'm just whatever man let them come to me 
Okay. I'll let them. Now, granted, you should crush and, and have them want you by your act, but also don't be that person that's like, oh, I don't need them. Screw them. I'm going to be over here. Like, you know, just, I guess, just be yourself. Just be you, really. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. I feel like you guys are very similar and uh, similar backgrounds. And, you know, yeah. I mean, you can see why you guys get along great. Um, yeah, that that's that's awesome, Paul. Where can uh, where can people find you if they want to check out more of your stuff? Yeah, so I have a uh, brand new website that dropped uh, Monday, and uh, episode two with Tom Green is up right now. It's called Dude. I called it. It's where I have a um, celebrity guest come on, whether it be a comedian, actor, uh, athlete, musician, and they talk about a prediction that they made in the past that actually happened, and then they make a future prediction. And Tom Green's dropped yesterday. It's hilarious. His predictions are amazing. Uh, well, his one big prediction at the end is amazing. You can check that out. That's on the official Dude I Call the YouTube channel. I have my own YouTube channel right now. It's got Verzi Effect podcast clips. Um, it, so I, I got uh, Whitney Cummings coming on tomorrow. That's going to be good. Um, I have uh, a bunch of comedians on there, so um, you can check that out on the YouTube channel. It also has stand-up clips. It's going to have sketches. It's going to have web series. And, uh, yeah, just get me on Instagram, Twitter, and um, Facebook and all the, all the good stuff that we all go on and get uh, angry about every day. I'm on all those things, too. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Paul, thank you so much for coming on. No worries. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye.